So since we are at 2 o'clock, let me introduce David Reamer. So David is an executive in residence at the Haas School of Business, and we're very glad to have him. Uh, he, is, he has a long history both as an entrepreneur, doing a couple of startups. He was the vice president of marketing at Yahoo. Uh, he's um, worked in stage and film, and, and his passion is storytelling. And that's what you're going to hear about today. And I just want to say this is a, his, what you're going to learn about storytelling today is very special. So we run a program for the U.S. National Science Foundation that we're rolling out across the country. And what, what David teaches about storytelling is what we are taking across the country for the U.S. National Science Foundation. So you really have an excellent speaker here and you're going to learn something special today. So please take it away, David. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, so I just want to start by applauding you guys because um, the fact that you're here uh, suggests an amazing accomplishment that you were able to make it through this gauntlet to make it to Berkeley to present your stories. Um, I was very impressed with what I saw this morning. About one-fourth of you know that I was a judge this morning. Um, so I had a chance to see a fourth of the presentations and uh, was very impressed with, with most of them. And also, uh, but there's still lots of room for you all to grow as storytellers. And I find this everywhere I go. It's one of the hardest parts of being an entrepreneur. is not just telling the story, but making sure you have a great story in the first place. So today we're going to talk about that. Um, Okie dokie. This is about stories and storytelling. They're two different things. And I'm going to try and help you understand what the difference is between a story and storytelling so you guys can think about how you can use both to advance your businesses. You can't tell a good story if you don't have a good story to tell. And I'm going to have to tell my photographer to try and slide over a couple of chairs because you're blocking my um, beautiful visuals. <laughs> And one of the things I tell you to do is set the stage. Make sure when you're giving your presentation that it's sort of all hanging together. I have another head. Your head is in, in front of my screen. Otherwise, I think, there we go. We're much better now. Um, let me tell you what I mean by this slide. So uh, who, who's seen Toy Story 3? Well, raise of hands. Great. So it's made it to different corners of the world. Uh, it's a great movie. Anybody want to know how much money, how much money do you think Pixar made making this movie? Any guesses? Half a billion, that's a good guess. But it's half right, it was billion dollars. So they made a billion dollars on this movie and one of the reasons they made so much money and one of the reasons why this is such a great movie and the guys who are working on, uh, on things like uh, supporting people like Pixar understand this, they spend a ton of time getting their story right. They take five years to make a movie. How many of those five years do you think, and I just put the answer up, do you think they spend working on the story? It's four years. 80% of the time when they make this movie, they're working on getting the elements of the story in place. And in that last year, they layer on all of those things that we see when we go to the movie. But the vast majority is working on the characters, working on the arcs of their story, making sure the ending is satisfying and that the whole story is in place. And you're saying, what does that have to do with startups? So well, I'll tell you in a minute. Because there's a lot of parallels between telling a story in a movie and telling a story about your company. What makes a great story, to start with, is a big problem. You've got to start with a big problem. And let me show you the trailer for this movie where they talk about the problem. Or let's hope that that doesn't happen. It worked in the first version. Hang on a second, folks. Oh, I think I know what I need to do. Bear with me, please. So just for your benefits, I did rehearse this beforehand. And uh, sometimes the demo doesn't work. OK, I'm going to try and find this, but not now. Let me tell you what happens in this story. I'm going to tell you what happens in, the, in this little trailer. In the trailer, we find out about the life of this guy. Do anybody know who this guy is, who this character is? That's Woody, right? And that's his buddy, Buzz. Um, and in this story, something really interesting thing happens. What, what's the reason for these guys to exist? Why do these, these toys exist? Why are they, what, what is their reason for being? To make, kids happy. to make kids happy, for kids to play with them, right? Well, right at the beginning of this story, we know that about this guy, but right at the beginning of the story, there's a huge conflict. Who remembers in the movie what the conflict is that these guys have to overcome if they want to be played with? What was that? No, that wasn't the conflict in, this, in Toy Story 3. What was that? 
kid's going to college. Andy, the guy who plays with these guys, is going off to college, and the toys start to freak out. Like, what are we going to do? Our whole reason for being is to be played with. Now no one's going to play with us, so now what are we going to do? And what happens is we watch the whole movie to find out if these guys are going to end up finding either Andy or another kid to play with them, and we enjoy the film because we sort of watch that adventure take place. Now let's see if this works, and if it doesn't, I'll explain this scene as well. Every product has a great story as well. And if you saw the movie The Social Network, did anybody see The Social Network here? It's really a great film. If you're an entrepreneur, that's your homework assignment. You have to see this movie. Because it's the story of how Facebook was created and what Mark Zuckerberg did to, to make it happen. But there's a great scene in this movie. There's a 30-second scene, which hopefully will play, which tells the story of the product. It tells the story of who the customer is, who's the character in the story of Facebook, and what, what was the insight that Mark Zuckerberg had? Thank you for your patience. OK, so I'm about to show you the scene from the movie, and then we're going to talk about the story of Facebook. There is a girl in your art history class. Her name is Stephanie Addis. Do you Mark. know she's a boyfriend? Mark, there is a girl in your art history class. Her name is Stephanie Addis. And do you happen to know if she's a boyfriend? Not, do you happen to know if she's looking to go out? Just have you them. ever seen her with anyone? And if not, do you happen to know if she's looking to go out with anyone? People don't walk around Mark? with a sign on them that says something. Mark? So there he goes. He starts coding. He runs across the campus in his flip flops. That wasn't in the product yet. Right. Relationship status. And he goes right. back to his room and he, he, in that he starts moment, coding. Does anybody remember what he added Facebook. to the product so that wasn't in the, the product yet? In this relationship story. status. Who's the character in the Facebook right. product story? In that little moment, customer? we saw the entire story of Facebook. So who is the, the character and what, who in this story? What do we know? Where was the Facebook product story? Who's the customer? Harvard. He was a Harvard student, so his friend was a Harvard student. Right. The friend. And, well, and who was the so friend? What do we know? Exactly where was Mark Zuckerberg building this product for? It was that kid sitting Harvard. He was a Harvard student, too. so his friend was, was a Harvard student. Right. What insight did he and have? So he knew in that exactly who he was, was building, this product, was building this product for. It was that kid sitting there. It was for him too, but it was it was for this kid. What insight did he have in that moment about his friend? Why couldn't he just go up to her and say, "You want to go out?" What was the insight? Most people have stalker well, why, tendencies. Why That's part that? of it. Why couldn't he just go up to her and say, do you want to go out? Say. Why, why wouldn't he just... He doesn't want to be rejected. That's part of it. But I think there's a detail around being rejected. Why wouldn't he just... That would just be terrible. He doesn't want to be rejected. That's part of it. But I think there's a detail around being rejected. Why wouldn't he just... That would just be terrible. So in that moment, he understood that. And he thought, OK, this is the answer I'm not rejected. The problem is I have to help him learn more about it. So in that moment, he understood that. And he thought, OK. This is the insight I have about my customer. Right. The problem is, so I that have was to the story. He went back and added that to the product. Here, so he did what he wants to do, which is built the product to deliver on it. Right. And that was that. So that was the story. He went back and added that to the product. He knew what his value proposition was. And storytelling. He, he, he built the product. What's to the difference? On that, and so the story is starting the customer, going into the insights of the customer, and then making sure they have a narrative of problems. So the story. Is starting with the customer, it's really the going into the insights of the customer, the context and then making sure we have a narrative of problem and solution. Okay? It's all then the once you have your idea and strategy and nailed what, sort of in what the context of the story. Then there's lots the of ways framework. to tell the story. And again, these are two different then things. Then once you have your idea and you really right nailed what you're, what you're here, doing, names, then there's lots of ways prices, to tell the story. Really and again, these are two different things. This is getting a strategy right there. Here, That's all the story. But both of these really things are focusing important. Your story coming Again, where I started is you cannot tell this great story. Um, you don't That's all the story tells. But we'll both of these things are important. important. Again, where I started is you cannot tell this great story if you don't have one in the first place. Pretty well known about entrepreneurs in the United States. First of all, why the story is told some great things about stories. Jack well known on Twitter, uh, entrepreneurs in the United States, who uh, says told some great things about well, stories. He develops products. He, he um, was like one of the Jack Dorsey of Twitter did also one of the actually interview with Twitter. him where he, he said when he says, develops a product, it's almost as if he develops products, he's one of the co founders of Twitter, and also one of the co founders of Twitter. And he said when he develops a product, it's almost as if he's putting on a play. He says his epiphany was that if you really understood the story, you would tell who this customer was, what their lifestyle was like, what their lifestyle was like, what they went through during the course of their day. And he said, when you understood the story, you would tell who this customer was, what their lifestyle was like, what they went through during the course of their day. 
and figured out this where these products fit into that overall story. This, used to run that this whole team could come together around to find a solution. In the United States. And this guy, Peter Cooper, has written a whole book about it. This is a guy who's run so many films. He runs a lot of sports teams in the United States. And he's a professor at UCLA's business school. And he wrote a book called Tells the Wind, where he says, the unifying theme of all the successful people he's met in his career is all walks of life. Tells the Mandela and Magic Johnson are all people who were great storytellers and, this guy's and also understood great storytelling. Story. So what Jack says is you have to have a story once you have it. So this means you know what to do. And this guy's doing this thing through great storytelling to be hugely successful. So there's some interesting science behind this. And so a lot of times science, when I talk about storytelling, some people sort of cross their arms and they go, that's um, just the How many grand dreams? Okay. So, so a lot of times when I talk about storytelling, about the next some people sort of cross their arms and because they go, that's this guy, Jonathan just Gottschall, wrote a book right. called The Storytelling well, Animal. I'm just if you don't take anything else away from this presentation, think about the next few slides. slides. But he said, because this guy, Jonathan book. Gottschall, wrote a Until book recently, called The Storytelling Animal. I'm just going to read a couple of things. stories the only thing I'm going to read off my slides today. But he said, in his book, until recently, we've only been able to speculate about stories' persuasion effects. But over the last several decades, 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 decades psychology has begun a serious study of how story affects the human mind. fiction, results repeatedly show that our attitudes, fears, hopes, and values are strongly influenced by story. In fact, and fiction, fiction is better seems to be more effective at changing beliefs than writing that is specifically What's designed to persuade here? through Why argument and evidence. Fiction chance. is better than the argument and evidence. The psychologists Melanie Green and Tim Brock argue that entering What's fiction going on worlds here? radically alters Why are we the way in a storyteller's process. hands? Green the psychologists Melanie Green and Tim Brock argue that entering story, fictional worlds radically the alters the way information the more is processed. They are in the story. Green and Brock studies and this, show that the more absorbed readers are in the story, story, the more the story when changes. When we read dry factual the more arguments, absorbed they are in the with story. our dukes up. And in this, there's an important we're lesson about the molding power of story. When, absorbed in a when we story, read dry we factual our arguments, we read with our dukes we're up. We're emotionally, we're critical and skeptical. And this seems to leave us absorbed in a story. We drop this our intellectual is an incredibly guard. powerful We're tool. We're moved emotionally, moved emotionally rather. And, I didn't and this see all seems to leave us defenseless. 30, however many there are. This is an incredibly uh, powerful tool. But the ones tool that I saw, I saw some more. really good presentations. And I didn't see all 28 presentations or 30, however many there are uh, today. And but the ones that I saw, that's a challenge, but I saw I some really good presentations, but nobody told me a story. And see if maybe you can find a way of telling some stories because you can really connect. And typically that's a challenge, but I think that you'll see if you listen to the rest of this talk and see if maybe you can find a way of telling some stories. Stories because you can what do really we do? connect related to our personal way. experiences. Whenever you and here's the has brain science cried at a movie. It. I cry at movies. Does anybody when else we hear cry a movies? story? Have you ever been at a, at a what movie do we do related to our personal experiences? Whenever you've been, you know, has anyone ever cried at a movie? I cry at movies. Does anybody else cry at movies? Well, have you ever been at a movie or read a book and been following a story? We literally imagine ourselves to be the protagonist in the story. We well, put ourselves the reason for that is when, we, when we're so following a story, we that literally weapon, imagine ourselves to be the protagonist in the story. Creating that we put ourselves in those shoes. Imagine if so imagine if you can use that as a weapon, who that and you're talking and about a product or service you're creating that's solving a problem for someone. The other thing that imagine happens if you is literally help them understand factor when we who tell that customer is and what they're going through, what they're dealing about, how the trees were green and birds The other thing that happens is literally a sinking factor when we tell a story. When I tell a story and I talk about how the trees were green and the birds were flying overhead, and then listen. suddenly there was a Literally, flash. We when I'm doing that, parts of our brain. certain parts of my brain and are going off when you're trying to motivate when that, the same exact thing happens to erase your idea. Literally, if you we activate that, the same that's parts of our brain. Powerful thing to do. And when you're trying to motivate remember, someone and inspire you someone to, do when you to embrace your idea, if you, you can do that, that's it. an incredibly powerful thing You have to get them to understand it. Because remember, there's three things you have to do when you tell someone your idea. You have to get them to remember it. You have to get them to understand it. Those three and things, you have and to a get lot of it is held by tell it. a good story. You're, if you you're could well do those three way. things, we're going to pause for the next meeting. Now. We're all going to tell those a story. Those three things, and a lot of it is, which if you is, tell a good story, uh, you're, you're, you're well on your way. We're going to pause for a second now. We're all going to tell a story, which is, try and find 60 seconds, a 60 second way of telling the person next to you, and try and talk to someone who you don't know, because they see people on the same team. How do you end up in the intel Tell them how you got here. Literally, how you got, not what plane you took or whatever, but how did you end up in the Intel Global Competition in Berkeley today? 60 seconds to tell the story. When you're done, I'm going to flip it over and have the other person tell you their story. 60 seconds. Ready? Go. This is the hardest part of the talk because we like to talk about ourselves and it's sometimes hard to stop the process, but you guys are really good. 
Who heard a really good story? Who heard a story that they're going to absolutely remember when they go home tonight? Yes, go ahead. So this, this is a story, you didn't hear it back there maybe, but a corporate banker who really wasn't passionate about it and became a journalist. And so what's, what's interesting about that story is it's unexpected. It's an unexpected path, and that's something you're going to remember because it was unexpected. What else? Anybody else hear a really great story? Any, anybody? I want to get with some, uh, someone from another place. Go ahead. You really got his emotions because you knew yeah. that when that moment happened that he knew he had to do this. Yeah, why his body uh, explanation not what is. Great. So um, you probably couldn't hear it in the back, but he talked about when the story, when he heard the story he heard, the storyteller was so animated that he got, the, from the expression of the person telling the story, he could see how passionate he was about what he was doing. Anybody else? Okay, that's, that's, that's fine for now. This, this, I do this exercise a lot, and if we had more time, we would really drill down in the process of trying to tell a story in 60 seconds and the art of doing it, and doing it in a way that everybody in the room's hands would go up and say, oh my god, I heard something amazing. Because you all have an amazing story, but it takes some work to figure out how to tell it in a compelling way. Let's talk about story structure. So in a classic story structure, in a narrative, you have characters. Characters have a motivation, there's a plot, and there's symbols. So in the case of Toy Story, Woody was uh, inspired to sort of, you know, be, it had to be played with. The toys had to be played with to exist. And, and then there's this, this conflict that happens in the plot. They find out that's his facial expression when he realizes Andy's going to college. And this is sort of where the story ends up. And all those things happen along the way. And there's some symbolic things that help us remember the story. Well, let's compare that to a story structure for a product. In this case, I'm going to tell you the story of BlackBerry, which is on hard times right now. But for 10 years, it dominated the market. And it dominated the market because it had an extraordinarily strong narrative, a product narrative. Let's take the character in the story. The person that's featured here is a woman named Carly Fiorona. I don't know if any of you know who she was. What did you remember? You know what she used to do? Right, she ran HP. Before that, she ran Lucent. And this story is set in about 1998, 1999, when she was at Lucent, um, running Lucent. And if you're a CEO of a company, what are you doing from six, 8 in the morning till 6 at night? What was that? Working. working, but where are you working? Where are you? Everywhere. There's a picture that's a little bit of a hint of where she might be. Your meetings, right? Your meetings, all, if you're a senior executive, you're in meetings all day long. And it used to be that was never a problem to be meetings all day long. But something interesting has happened in the 90s that sort of transformed the way business was done. What, 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 what changed over the 90s? How did people start to communicate? By email. So I'm just going to put you back in, in time just to set this story in context. When I started my career in 1985, I'm going to borrow your pad. When we communicated, we actually used something called paper, right? And we actually wrote notes on paper. And we would put them in a box on the corner of our desk, and a guy in the mailroom there was a thing called a mail room. A guy would come around with a basket. He would take our mail, our paper, and he would bring it to the mail room and put it in a bunch of different boxes and bring you another set of stuff. You would put that in your briefcase. You would take that home. You'd write notes on it. And the next day, you'd come in, and you would put it on your desk, and that same man would come and distribute it. I swear to God, that's how we communicated when I started my career. It was actually worked that way. Well, business is changing. It's the 90s. People are using email. But believe it or not, for the younger people in the room, in 1999, there still wasn't a good way to get email unless you were sitting in front of a computer. What was the PDA of choice in 1999? Palm, right? So Palm, everybody had a Palm who had a PDA, but it was crappy for email. So these guys said, you know what? This woman's feeling pain. If she's a CEO and there's all this communication going on, how is she feeling? What's the insight about her? She's a CEO, and, she, and all of this communication is going on. How does she feel? Stressed. Stressed. Keep going. Disconnected. disconnected. Go deeper than disconnected. What was that? 
left out, out of control. Imagine being the CEO of a company and knowing there's other people around you who know what's going on that day, and you're completely clueless. That's a really powerful insight. And BlackBerry understood it, and they built a device expressly to solve that. The value proposition was, we'll keep you connected. And the way they're going to keep you connected is by letting you get your email wherever you are. And they built a device with a QWERTY keyboard, a big screen, back-end connection into the exchange servers through the corporate email. Voila, they've solved that problem. And that may seem so obvious to us now, but they built a business where they dominated the market for 10 years because they really understood that customer and that insight. And I really encourage you guys to do that because the better presentations that I heard today and that I always hear at these competitions, this is the fourth or fifth Intel competition I've judged, are the ones that are based on really powerful deep insights about the people that you're building your products and services for. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go. So these are the elements of the story. The protagonist in the story is the customer, is your customer. The motivation in a narrative in your innovation story are the customer insights. The conflict in a traditional story, in your case, is the problem definition. And you know if you don't have a really crisp problem definition, how do you know what to build? You have to know what problem you're solving. The plot imperative, or where the story wants to go, where the character in the story wants to go, in the case of an innovation story, that's your value proposition. The plot narrative is the product delivery, and then the setting is sort of your positioning, and then the tone of the story is also there's some attributes and personality about your products and brands over time that can really help with your differentiation. You're telling a story. You're telling a story with your product. So let's start. Let's go through each of these just to try and understand them a little bit more. Who's the main character in your story? This is identifying your customer. And again, several people today had a very clear description of who they were serving, and other people were saying, well, we could serve everybody. Well, if you could serve everybody, how do you know what to start and build with today to get your first customer? Facebook started with a very specific customer. Facebook has a billion users today, but when they started, their customers were Harvard students. He built it for Harvard students. And then it went to other Ivy League students, and then it went to other college students, and then it went to overseas college students, and then these college students graduates, and it went to people who graduated college. And now, the fastest growing segment on Facebook, the second and third target customer, are people my age. Oh, she's a little older than me. But people my age, and we're using it completely differently. We're stalking our children with Facebook, right? <laughs> Apropos of the stalking comment. Right? That's why we use Facebook. But the point is they had to get the Harvard students before they could get the Yale students, before they could get all the college students and then ultimately move on. Have a specific target when you launch your business. This is an interesting story. Air New Zealand um, used to go about their innovation by thinking about their, their sections of travel, first class, business, and coach. And then they started thinking about targets differently and it led to completely new ideas. They said, you know what, let's think about the family that's traveling. And let's understand the problems of the family. And when they got into the insights of a family, if anyone, anybody here have a bunch of kids and had to fly over a big giant oceans, right? It's a nightmare. And they went through and understood that. And what they did is they basically built a solution for Air New Zealand flights, which typically are traveling from New Zealand to San Francisco or London. They built a, a seat that folds out and makes the whole thing a couch. And you're thinking, well, that's a great idea. Why didn't anybody think of that before? Because nobody thought about that particular target segment and tried to find, solve a problem for that target segment of a family. It was always, what can we do for the coach flyer? Let's talk about the character's motivation, digging for insights. This is a visual from a great uh, story about the Huggies pull-up, which was um, based on one comment. They built a billion-dollar business on one comment they heard in these interviews. It used to be that what, what the Huggies people, the Kimberly Clark people did is they said, um, let's constantly find ways to build better technology, always looking for the technology solution, better technology to make diapers wick moisture better. And then one day they said, let's do some ethnographic research and go into people's homes and just listen to them talk about what it's like having kids. And they kept hearing over and over again the same problem as they were leaving the interviews. They'd say, is there anything else you want to tell me? And many of the parents said, with real chagrin on their face, you know what I hate? I hate when people say, oh, your kid's still in diapers? And they look at you like you're a bad parent because your kid's still in diapers. And they heard that comment. They were thinking, you know what? Maybe what we need to do is we need to create a diaper that's not a diaper. We need to create a diaper that's clothing. And they built the Huggies pull-up, which is a diaper that's like underwear that the Baby, the child pulls up while they're going through potty training. It's a billion dollar business today. 
And it was all based on understanding that insight, looking at the people's expressions when they're talking and really understanding what's that deep-seated motivation and insight that's going to drive a big business. Here's another great story from this exact competition a few years ago. So a couple of uh, engineers came over from Singapore. They were Indian expats. And they told the story of the modern Indian family where both parents are for the first time are now working. Both professionals and they're both working. And they've got this terrible pull between them. On the one hand, uh, they both want to work, they want to support the family and get ahead. But on the other hand, they want to hold on to their culture. And one of the most important things in Indian culture is food, like in any culture. And one of the most important, important foods in Indian culture is the roti. And they said, how can we help these people hold on to their culture in a way that lets them live this new lifestyle? And I'll tell you what they did in a minute, although I certainly teased the answer. Another thing I want to say is that many of you, um, when I give these kinds of talks, I hear from, from students and from entrepreneurs, well, that's not true of a business, right? I've got a business-to-business -business solution, and there's no, there's no insights in business, right? They're just businesses. Well, people work in businesses, and business solutions also are based on insights about how people work in the workplace and what problems you're solving for businesses. This happens to be a startup in the Silicon Valley that's basically trying to solve the problem, the insight that we get more work done when we can walk the halls and we can literally walk into someone's office and just drop in. And with distributed workforces where people are all over the globe, that's really that's impossible to do. And they're basically building a solution that tries to recreate that experience through a user interface on a computer so that you know who's in their office and you can literally sort of knock on their door to open a communication. It's all based on that one insight. Okay, we have a customer in our story or the character. We have the insights. We know the character's motivation. Now we need to create that big conflict, right? There needs to be that problem that we overcome. And again, any great uh, uh, investor is going to tell you you've got to have a really crisp problem definition if you're going to build a successful business. Here's what the Zimplistic guys did. And they came in third place globally in the competition um, with this simple story. And I literally pulled this from their presentation. I haven't changed a thing. They described the problem as the pain. They said roti, or chapati, or pukla is the staple diet of 800 million Indians who eat 2.4 billion rotis every day. That's a big problem. Roti making is such a skillful, tedious, and time-consuming task that people are resorting to unhealthy means such as frozen rotis, bread, and they're eating more rice. There is no completely automatic kitchen appliance like a rice cooker to make rotis with just a click of a button in the market today. That's a pretty good problem statement. It's telling me it's huge, it's being super clear, and there's an analog. Analogs are great when you're making a presentation because they give people a frame of reference. I may never have heard of a roti, but I probably know somebody who's got a rice cooker. In fact, I probably know a lot of people who have rice cookers. And of course, once you've got the pain, it's really easy to articulate the painkiller, again, right from their presentation. In this case, the rotimatic, a revolutionary kitchen appliance, compact as a mini microwave oven that enables anyone to make rotis. Then they're prints and ready-made, and they literally had a demo. It was awesome. It was a great presentation. And again, these were engineers. These were not fancy business people or marketers. And they just gave a really simple story where we really understood the problem definition and the insights behind it. Another thing to think about is um, romance the problem. Your solution is going to sound so much better if the problem sounds bigger. This is another thing that people seem to jump past. Make the problem sound really bad. For your customer, it probably is pretty bad, or you wouldn't be working, spending your life trying to solve it for them. Let me show you a video that Google did for so. Google Chrome. And basically what they were trying to do is, you know, this is Google Chrome that comes with a, with, a, with a netbook or notebook so that you can instantly get access to the internet. And they wanted to help people understand why the current ways that computers start are just so crazy. They romance the problem. Here you go. You are on the internet using a web browser. Y you know, that thing with the address bar and back button and bookmarks. The thing you're in right now, up there, yeah, that's your web browser. If you're like me, when you're on your computer, you spend something like, I don't know, 90% of your time on the internet in a browser. There's emails, chatting, you're reading news, watching videos, playing games, you're buying things, just to name a few. Which kind of makes the web browser the most important program on your computer. And if you think about it, it hasn't always been this way. You see, web browsers were first designed a long time ago with the old internet in mind. You know, back when it was slow and mainly just words with links that just send you to more words with 
links, back before all of these innovations. So some guys at Google asked, what if we redesigned the web browser from scratch with an eye towards the new web? You know, maps, video, and web apps that are a lot more dynamic. And so they created Chrome, a web browser that's crazy fast on today's internet. And it's sleek and more secure, but mostly it's really fast. I mean, my biggest question when I boot up my computer is how long till I get on the internet, right? I mean, if there isn't any internet, I might not even use my computer. Did you know that even the fastest computers will still take like 45 seconds to boot up? 45 seconds. You can make a sandwich in that time. So here's what's going on when your computer's booting up. There's this list of things to do, stuff I'm sure you don't care about, but it cranks through them one at a time. What you probably notice is that your programs begin loading up slowly. And if you're like me, as soon as you see your web browser icon appear, you're like double clicking it over and over and over. Let's go, buddy. I got some emails to read. Well, all et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But what they really did is they, they really helped me understand this is a big problem so I could know that their solution was a great solution because they romanced that problem. Okay, and by the way, all of you could, could do more on that as well, just again, from my experience today. Really romance the problem that you're solving. The next thing is to articulate the value proposition. Seems simple, but getting it down to its essence, like what's the ultimate benefit of what you're creating is really hard um, and really important. If I told you that Twitter, if I was pitching Twitter and I said Twitter was a core, their core technology was a device agnostic, agnostic message routing system with rudimentary social networking features and by accepting messages from SMS, mobile, web, instant messages from third party API projects, I mean, if you're an engineer, you might think, oh, that's really cool. But most people would hear that and it would be like, what does this thing do? That's what it does. What it does for people is it answers the simple question. It lets you know, let people know what you are doing. That's the value proposition of Twitter. It, you, it, it lets you tell people what you were doing. And there's a big distinction between telling people your value proposition is this and your value proposition is this. Get to the benefit. Some really nice illustrations uh, of uh, all over the, the internet of, of really cool examples of people sort of getting this right. This was a company that won a, a global uh, innovation competition and basically th these guys, Andrew and, and Natalie, work for a paper company and uh, they do industrial paper solutions and one of the things they realize from talking to customers is that no matter how hard you try and tell people in industrial environments to wash their hands for 20 seconds in warm water, nobody does that. It's just not what people do. I got things to do, I gotta go. It's like this guy, come on, I can make a sandwich in 20 seconds, right? So what they did is they realized that what they needed to do was in terms of making, uh, coming up with an antiseptic solution, they had to put it into the towel them itself. So they came up with a solution which was where they came up with an antibacterial towel, dry towel that people use after they wash their hands and they won a, a global award for that. And it was really, if you were to boil that all down in one statement, the benefit would be better hygiene without careful washing. That's what they did. And if you watch this video, they talked about this for about two minutes. They really had a hard time sort of getting to the essence of that. But part of the challenge is to figure out how do I articulate that essence so that I know what to do. There's often cases of people who never had a value proposition. Who here used Google Wave? Who here tried Google Wave? Right? Is anybody using it today? No, because they shut it down. And the reason they shut it down, and Google has created one of the most amazing products in our lifetime in terms of search and search engine marketing. But in this particular case of Google Wave, they never really understood the narrative. Who's using Google Wave? What problem is it solving? They took a bunch of communication technologies and put them together and they put it up there. And because 25, 30 million people didn't use it right away, they shut it down. When I work with students, a lot of times I ask them, be the product manager on Google Wave and come up with a narrative for me. And people actually come up with lots of different ways that Google Wave, which is an integration of communications tools, could be useful to certain kinds of people in certain kinds of contexts to solve certain kinds of problems. But unless you actually make that effort to look for that, then you're, not gonna, you're gonna end up with Google Wave, which they shut down. Let's talk about the plot. How does the innovation work? So now I've got all those elements. I know what problem I'm solving. I know what my value proposition is. Now I've gotta somehow say what the product does and I have to boil it down um, and make it tangible. A lot of times uh, we're, we're challenged. We want to tell everybody everything about the product, but we can't come up with that simple way of making it tangible. Zappos uh, is famous. They're, they're all about service. Their core value, number one, is wow through service. They say customer service isn't just a department. Anybody who works there knows that Zappos is about service. But if I'm a customer, what specifically does that mean? How do they make that real? 
Well, they offer instant checkout. They have a call for support, an immediate pickup option. They have free overnight delivery in almost everything they do. And they have a 365-day money-back guarantee. Those are all proof points that go, oh, I get it. They really care about service, and they're doing these things to basically deliver that. This is another illustration that I really like of this, uh, this drill that also won a, a global innovation competition. It's called the gyro. Uh, and basically what it does is this is a drill that as you move your hand to the left, the gyro and it tells it to go in a counterclockwise fashion. If you move to the right, it goes clockwise. So you don't have to press any buttons. You're literally just based on your hand position. And you can see when you go to the site, you don't have to read pages to understand how it works. There's this very simple graphic. It says grip to activate light, twist right for forward, twist left for reverse. And then they have a brief explanation of what's behind it, this gyroscopic technology. And in that one simple graphic, I get the whole story. Now think about what you were asked to do. You were asked to put together a board that told the story as much as the story as possible. Some of you did a great job of telling me the whole story in that board, including how it works, which is what this is. And some of you, not so much. It's a very important thing. How can I telegraphically, quickly, get across what it is that our product does? And then, of course, there's always the question to the MVP, what's the minimum viable product? And that's something every one of you wrestles with you every time you're, you're starting something new and on a new product. This is an example of a website called GARMS. And I like it because it's a nice illustration of like when is enough enough for me to launch this product? This product, is, this service is about if I'm a designer and I don't yet have a production line, and I've just got some great designs, but I don't have it, it's not being produced yet or merchandised. This is a website that lets me post the design, have people in the community favorite it. If it wins from all of the favorites and it gets, bubbles up to the top, then they say they're going to design it gets produced. Well, these guys can't deliver on this unless they can also literally do the marketing, the production, and the distribution of the product. So they needed to have all of those elements in place for their MVP to come to fruition. They couldn't launch this product without that if they were going to deliver on this value proposition of get your designs into the marketplace. OK, where's the story set? Context is really important, and color is really important. Um, this is just one illustration of many. This is a company, Bleacher Report. Anybody know Bleacher Report here? This is a, sort of an American phenomenon, maybe one person, couple. Um, so Bleacher Report is a website where the content is created largely by fans of the sport, under the premise that the people who are most passionate about the sports teams are the fans who follow it. And some of them might be good writers. And these guys are competing within a very, very crowded space, Yahoo and ESPN and local sports sites. A bunch of people where they're professionals writing content, they said, we can compete against them by creating this new sort of vector on this competitive continuum, giving the fan a voice. And they carved that space out and they built a great product, and they sold to Turner Sports for $175 million last year. So they built a really great story in a marketplace that content is a really tough place to compete in, and they found a way to be successful. I love this story because the greatest in tech marketer of our lifetime, Steve Jobs, actually launched the iPod Touch, and he wasn't sure what it was. And that's actually OK. Sometimes you have to go into the market, and you have to sort of find out what you have. They launched this product and they went into the market. And let me read you this quote that he said in September of uh, 2009, I believe, after the product had already been in the market for a while. Originally, we weren't exactly sure how to market the touch. Was it an iPhone without the phone? Was it a pocket computer? What happened was, what customers told us was, they started to see it as a game machine. We started to market it that way and it just took off. Now, basically what he's saying is we didn't know what the narrative was. We didn't know who was using it. We didn't know why they were using it. We didn't know what it was doing for them until it got into the market. And that's, I put this up to say that's OK. Sometimes you start with a, hypoth a hypothesis in your narrative, and it may not be exactly right. And you have to look for where is the narrative in my product story. And Steve Jobs, greatest of all time, admitting that that's exactly what they did with the iPod Touch. What are some story challenges? All of these things can be challenges for you when you're trying to figure out your story. You're trying to figure out your strategy, and many more. But here are just a few. Do we have a technology looking for a problem to solve? I saw at least one of those today. Do we have a customer, in, and what I mean by that is a really cool technology, but haven't quite figured out who's going to use it for what reason to solve what problem? Do we have a customer insight, but no clear problem definition? 
So we really understand these, what's making people tick, but we haven't found a way to crisply define, okay, because people feel that way, this is the problem I'm gonna solve. Oops. Um, are we are we debating between first target customers? This happens all the time. Um, you know, there's so many people who can use this. Do I use this group or that group? You guys talked in your game device, your game platform about you could go to gamers, you could go to teachers. Lots of people could use your platform, but you made a choice, and that was the right thing to do. Make that choice. Make sure you deliver a product for a customer and make sure they're going to be happy with it. Do we have a clear problem definition but the inability to provide a viable solution? That happens too. We know exactly what problem to solve, but we haven't really come up with the MVP yet that's good enough to deliver that value proposition. And do we have a great story, but someone else got there first? And if someone else got there first, we heard a great idea today, which had many competitors, at least in America, but they did such a great job of telling us how they were going to solve the problem, and they did it so elegantly, we were convinced. And in fact, when we went back to discuss it, um, that's sort of where the conversation went with the other judges when we talked about the space. They said lots of people are in that space, but we said, no, this group <coughs> is really on top of it, and they're going to do a better job than the other people out there. So you have to be able to do that. Yes? I think he would have looked for, for, um, for, for that particular product. He, prob he probably would have asked the same question he asked his own people. Who's going to use this and, and what problem is it solving for them? He innately did that. He was the best at doing what he did because he was innately a great at everything I've been talking about today. Let me answer your first question now. Um, last night I was uh, at the Koretsu uh, Angel Investor Forum competition. Koretsu is a bunch of angel investors. They get together. People pitch their businesses. Um, and after the session, uh, one of the judges, who was a venture capitalist, said, nobody told the story. Um, I'm sorry. They, they said, that, um, let me change that. We, that comment came up today in today's session that nobody told the story. Last night, there were three teams that told really good stories, and they were the top three teams in the competition. And the judges were all venture capitalists, and they voted. So whether they articulate that they like stories or that stories are just effective, when you tell a story for all the reasons I described, you will, you will make a difference with people. We have this tendency to think that if we, if we do something like that, we're not going to sound like business people. That's the thing I'm trying to beat out of you, right? When you tell a story, you're being human. And if there's someone on the other end who's going to benefit from what you're doing, and you can really make that emotion come through of how you're going to affect somebody's life, um, th even in the, in the, in the uh, I'm not going to give you the specifics of this, but in our little judging session afterwards, someone was telling the story about their business which is a business that exists here that doesn't exist in the country where it was being developed. And it, sounded, it didn't sound terribly exciting to some of the people in the room. But one of the judges, who's a venture capitalist, told a story about how this was going to change the people's lives in a way that nobody in the room had thought about. And that instantly changed the room's opinion about the effect of this particular product. Um, and they ended up getting pushed up the list. So stories are hugely powerful, and venture capitalists absolutely respond to stories. And people are getting better at it, too, so you've got to get good at it because the competition is good. I have about 10 more minutes. I want to share a few more things with you. How to tell a great story. So, so far I've been talking about structure. I've been talking about strategy. I've been making sure you actually have a customer. You know who your customer is. You know what problem you're solving, et cetera. Now you've got all that. To tell a great story, you're up against all sorts of stuff that's going to make it hard for you to be successful. There's preconceived notions. There's everybody else's idea. You're not the only person who's trying to solve this problem. There's personal agendas. There's distractions. There's risk aversion. There's all sorts of things um, that in corporations make it hard to get things done, but even in the real world, uh, in the entrepreneurial world, make it hard to get things done. And one of your defenses against all this stuff is having a great and compelling story. Now, Mark Twain, or in some cases it's attributed to Pascal, is uh, supposed to have said, I would have written you a short letter, but I didn't have the time. 
the short letter is harder to write, right? If I asked you to tell your personal story in 15 seconds, that would have been harder than the 60 seconds, and it would have been harder still than the two minutes. But if you can do it well in a short period of time, it forces you to get down to the essence of your story, what's most important. You can always expand from there. If you can't get down to the short story, last night in this Koretsu competition, uh, you had two minutes to tell your whole story. I've seen competitions where you have one minute to tell the whole story. And the people who were at one last night in this competition didn't just tell a part of the story in those two minutes. In a very unhurried, relaxed fashion, they told the entire narrative. And people who can do that in two minutes, they do two things. One, they help the person on the other end actually understand what they're doing and maybe remember it. But two, it makes them sound smart. What makes you sound not so smart is if you spend the two minutes just describing the problem or the two minutes just describing the solution and not explaining who it's for. Be brief. This guy was a genius at it. He always had a headline. The world's thinnest computer is what he came out with when he launched the MacBook Air. He always had a villain. Villains are good. If you can introduce a villain in your story, that's great. Who was his first villain way back in 1984? Who? IBM. IBM. Who was his next villain in the sort of the 2000s? Microsoft. Who's his villain now? Well, it's not his, but who's the villain now? I don't know, maybe it's Samsung, maybe it's Google, who knows who it is. Um, it's interesting, Samsung sort of flipped it and now Apple is the, is the villain in the Samsung story. But he was great at creating a villain. He could, again, it's romancing the problem, make your product sound better. Always had a simple slide. Does anybody remember the visual he had when he launched the Air, the MacBook Air? It was coming out of something. What was it coming out of? A manila envelope. It's, got, it's like a piece of paper. That, I mean, that still stays with people. He always did a demo, right? So he would, you know, take his phone out of his pocket and order 4,000 lattes when he was launching the iPhone. And he always had a holy smokes moment. And something to think about, and I'm going to show you a quick video in a moment. When you give a presentation, pace it. Find that place to build up to something, and then when you really have something important in your story, give it some time and air and, and, and make it happen that way. He said when he launched uh, this product, he said, today I'm about to launch the world's most um, advanced uh, internet communications device. And I'm going to uh, launch the most, uh, the, the most powerful music, uh, mobile music device and the world's most advanced phone. I'm going to introduce all three of those things today. And then he paused and he took one thing out of his pocket. The place went nuts, right? Because he knew how to tell a story. He knew how to build the momentum. Let me show you a quick scene and then we'll wrap it up. Who has seen this scene? Anybody? Okay, you have. Thank you. So let me give you Joe the context Hannah. for the story. There's a television show in the United States called Mad Men, and it's about the advertising business in the United States in the 1960s, so like 50 years ago, the early 50s. Early, early 60s, but 50 years ago. And what you're about to see is a guy from the advertising agency going to Kodak, and this is when they used hardcore facts to sell technology. It's before they used emotion to sell technology. And they went up there, and their goal was to convince the engineers at Kodak not to call this new product that portrayed images through a projector, not to call it the wheel. That's what the Kodak guys wanted to call it. So their goal in this meeting was to innovate by getting them to think differently about how you talk about technology. Lynn Taylor. No Eastman's today, unfortunately. They're all back in the lab. It's a wonderful facility, but they don't take vacations. What do they show? Slides of them working? <laughs> <laughs> so have you figured out a way to work the wheel into it? We know it's hard because wheels aren't really seen as exciting technology, even though they are the original. Well, technology is a glittering lure. But uh, there's the rare occasion when the public can be engaged on a level beyond flash if they have a sentimental bond with the product. My first job, I was in-house at a fur company with this old pro copywriter, Greek, named Teddy. And Teddy told me the most important idea in advertising is new. It creates an itch. You simply put your product in there as a kind of calamine lotion. But he also talked about a deeper bond with the product. Nostalgia. It's delicate, but potent. Sweetheart.
Teddy told me that in Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a twinge in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. This device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. It goes backwards and forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. It's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. It let's us travel the way a child travels. Around and around, and back home again. To a place where we know we are loved. Good luck at your next meeting. There you go. See if they can make it, make it to the next meeting without crying. What did he do? He was an incredibly powerful storyteller. What did he do there that was so, that he, there were like six or seven things he did. Can anyone name some of his techniques that were so effective? Pacing. pacing. Incredible pacing, right? He took his time. That was only about two minutes, but it felt like a, you know, it was like a major motion picture. That was just two minutes long. What else? Connect. What was that? Connect. He connected. How? Like, Emotionally, how, what did he use? Story that can the story that Story that what? That he told a story that others can relate to. Do you think those other guys in the room had families? Of course they did. And who were those pictures of? Himself, right? He let his own emotion, his own personality come through. If there's ever an opportunity with your product to bring yourself into the story, or someone you know, do it. Because you're, you can't help but be more expressive, more passionate, more emotional, and your body language tell the story. Really powerful. He did that. What else did he do? Changed his voice tone. He told a story within a story. What was the story within a story? Who was the character in that story? Anybody remember the guy's name? Greek guy. What's his name? Teddy, right? We know his name. We know he's Greek. Why does it matter that he's a Greek guy? Why did he tell that story? What was, he, what was the point he was trying to make? Nostalgia. This whole thing hinges on the notion you're trying to get technologists for the first time in 1962 to use emotion to sell technology. Nostalgia was core to that whole sales pitch. And he told a story around it so you'd remember it. He introduced this character, Teddy, a Greek guy. Nostalgia is a Greek word, etc. right? Super powerful stuff. He did a bunch of other things. He said it's not a wheel, it's a time machine. He came up with some other metaphors, etc. Really powerful. There are guys named Chip Heath and Dan Heath who wrote a book about what he just did. It's called Made to Stick. And in this book, they talk about techniques to get people to actually remember what you're saying. I guarantee you, there are people, I, I will go home tonight, and I'll sit down at the dinner table, and I'll tell my wife about the presentations, and I'll remember most of them. And I'll remember them if there were good stories, and I would remember them even better if you guys told even greater stories. Keep it simple. Be as concrete as you can. Use emotions and tell stories wherever possible. Even if you think investment bank investors are not going to want to do this, I guarantee you they'll be effective. Be credible. And whatever you do, try and find something that's unexpected. In the early 60s, um, to have a guy tell a story about his family in an office would have been incredibly shocking. Um, and, and yet, it's the kind of thing everybody in that room went home that night and talked to their spouse about that experience. Um, we're running out of time. I just want to leave you with a couple of uh, last thoughts. Give your idea a name. If, you ever, uh, if, if, if you, everybody has a product with a, with a name, but try and always come up with a name that's going to be memorable. Um, and as I said, always try and tell them your story if you have one. I'm going to leave you on this one. 
This woman, um, Serbi Sarnha, uh, was working on a project and it was sort of making a little bit of progress, but she wasn't making a ton of progress. And she went to the Draper University uh, down in Silicon Valley, which is Tim Draper's uh, sort of accelerator training ground. And while she was talking to him, uh, she's working on an incredible uh, project that's designed to detect ovarian cancer in an early stage. And while she was talking to Tim Draper, this great venture capitalist, um, one of the most famous ones in, in the country, uh, she mentioned that she had an ovarian cancer scare when she was 13 years old. And, and Draper leaned forward, he said, how come you never told me that before? How come that hasn't been a part of your pitch? He said, well, I didn't think anybody wanted to hear my story. It was too personal. He said, no. He said, first of all, Telling me that story, I so much better understand the narrative of what you're trying to do. I really understand um, who your customer is and what problem you're trying to solve for them. But I also believe more in you because I now know why you're doing this. I understand your backstory. I understand what's behind this. I know why it's important. I just realized Noah's in the room. Do you like stories, Noah? Are they helpful? No. Okay. Noah's a venture capitalist. See him afterwards for some money if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Mean, right. That's, that's right. what you know leads to most you know achieving great things that no one expects you to achieve. Right. What Noah said is, where's the passion? Where's the motivation? Where's your passion and motivation? What's your story? Because the one thing we know for sure as an entrepreneur is that you are going to run into brick walls every single day. Some are going to be bigger, and some of them are going to be smaller, and some are going to be huge. And the people who just have to solve this problem because they're so passionate about it for whatever reason are the ones who are going to be successful. And, and people like Noah, that's what they look for in, uh, in their entrepreneurs. Dave, you can do Q&A for about 10 minutes. OK. Ten minutes. Um, the uh, final thought, and then we'll open it up to questions, is one of the most important reasons to have a good story and a succinct story that's clear is that so anybody can tell it. Because what you want, where you're successful, is when someone comes across you and they go, and they meet someone else and they tell your story and then they tell somebody else and the word spreads and it's the right story that's being spread. That's when you win. And the only way to do that is to A, have a good story and to tell it well. Uh, and if you do both of those things, other people will be able to pass it on and that's when you're really successful. So thank you. And um, why don't we uh, do a little Q&A? Yes? What's the best story What's the best story I've ever heard? I I've got a clip on here I didn't show, which I think is incredibly powerful. It's a woman who started a company called Weavorse. And she told the story of how when she was eight years old, she was a product of divorce. And um, she was eight years old, and her parents couldn't decide who was going to get custody of her. So they went to the judge, and the judge turned to the kid, this woman, and they said, um, the judge said, which parent do you want to be with? Imagine being that kid. Imagine that, that, that moment. And that inspired her to start this company. It inspired her to go and try and build a platform. She's built a platform to help people going through a divorce, to get all the resources they need and manage it in a way. Because if you've been divorced, most people haven't been divorced before. Some people have. But most people are going through it for the first time. They don't know what to do. And they don't know how to do it in such a way to avoid that. When you see this video, and you can see it online, um, you see her telling the story of her company. You completely understand she's going to go through walls. She's going to be someone who's going to build a successful company. She's raised like four and a half million dollars. She's growing market after market. Um, an incredibly powerful, uh, heartfelt story. And I'll never forget that moment because who can imagine being in those shoes? And she's building a product to solve that. Yes? Until you reach 30, um, what, what is the uh, importance of pace of storytelling? I, to me, the importance is. One of the things we tend to do is we, we're, we just want to get it over with, right? If we're giving the talk, we just want to be done already. But the power in your telling a story is you have a chance to build up to the most critical thing, right? Um, you guys are, are building a solution to make it easier to live in your apartment. Um, but I really want to understand the story, the character in that story. I want to know what it's like to live in an apartment, why there's certain challenges. Um, and I want you to romance that problem. And I want you to like, have me hanging on that conflict. And then when I really understand the conflict and you can read in my eyes that I'm with you, then you can hit the punchline, this is what we're doing to solve that problem. And if you're just rushing through it, I don't have a chance to sort of catch up. Remember, the person you're talking to is hearing the story for the first time. Yes? I'm interested to ask that. I expect that before. Sometimes you have a problem, but the other people uh, don't have the same situation. For example, you tell about the family. I don't have a kid. How do you 
So, so, okay, great, great, great question. So he said he doesn't have a kid that this story of this Weavor story, is that what you're talking about? Um, if you're a human being, and this, is, and this is true, read a book, watch a movie. You're going to often read about characters. You're going to see people in movies that would never be you. It could be a woman. It could be someone who's 90 years old. If you're human, what you tend to do, it's again, you put yourself in the shoes of the protagonist, and you imagine that they're them. If a story is told well, again, when, one of the things that happens all the time, and I'm glad you brought this up, is people say, well, how can I convince people that this is a problem? I always tell uh, entrepreneurs to bring the customer into the room and put the customer next to them. Not literally, but figuratively. Because your best defense about someone saying, is this really a problem or not, is to bring the customer into the room so they can really understand the problem. Even if you're not the customer, you have to bring that customer to life. Tell a story about that customer so I can connect with them, even if I don't understand that person. Bring them to the reality of your customer, right? It's, and unless you are the customer, and then yes, bring them to your reality. But they have to understand who your customer is intimately. And the more powerful those insights, the deeper those insights, and I showed you a few examples today, usually the more powerful the solution is going to be. Any other questions? Back of the room, anybody? Last one. Yes. Excuse me? Yeah. I would, I would say, if you can't find the story in what you're doing, I would say you're not there yet. Uh, th you, you're there when you actually have the narrative. Sometimes, you, you know, a lot of times people, have, I've worked with people who've built a great technology that's incredibly cool, um, but they never really had a narrative. They really didn't know how people were going to use it, how it was going to be useful. It was cool, but they didn't figure out who it was going to be useful for and how it was going to be useful. And I would say they didn't have their story yet. So you have a couple of choices. You can launch it like Google Wave or the iPod Touch and watch it and see who uses it and look for the narrative in the users. That's a totally viable way to do it. I don't know if it's ideal, but it's viable. Or they can keep talking to customers one after the other, and that's the discipline. I don't know where Andre is, but that's the discipline that we, we like to teach, which is talk to 100 customers. And the more customers you talk to, the more likely it is you're going to find where the story is. And if you talk to 100 customers and you still haven't found the story, then maybe you're not there. So it, you don't have to be a great storyteller to tell a great story. And I've seen a lot of people who aren't really charismatic and they're not you know, great at standing in front of a room, but if they've got a really powerful story and they've put all the pieces together and they know how to tell it, uh, they can do a tremendous job even if they're not a great presenter. That's all the time I have. Thank you, everybody.